In this lesson, I'd like to finish talking about uh, our introduction to distillation columns. So, what I've got on this screen is some images of distillation equipment, just things taken from the web. Basically, you'll have a tower or a column. They may be called either thing. They're quite tall, so you'll notice here that this has uh, got catwalks at several levels here to give you an indication of how tall these things may end up being. Uh, they are typically much narrower than they are wide, but occasionally you'll have something that's not that way. So, But they're big. Okay, These are frequently things that when you drive past a plant on a highway, a refinery, something like that, you may see these towers and they may be lit up and you can really tell you know there's something to notice. What's going on inside is really the important part and there are two types of internals. We have trays shown here or we have random packing. Okay. Now random packing is studied more in the continuous mass transfer course but we'll talk about it some in this course also and it's designed so that you just dump the stuff inside the tower. You may have some layers of free space in between to redistribute the fluid, but basically the tower would just be filled with these random pieces. And they might be as little as a half an inch in diameter. They might be several inches in diameter. And they can have all sorts of various shapes. What we're going to emphasize more frequently in this course is the trays. And we have lots of different kinds, but most of the time you're going to use sieve trays or valve trays are sometimes used. There's also older bubble cap trays and so forth. And sieve trays basically, as you can see here, are plates with holes in them. And the holes are done in different ways, arranged different ways. Some are big holes, some are little holes. Okay, And then you'll have places where there's a lip, this will be against the wall of the column, and there's a lip, so you'll build up liquid, but then the liquid will flow over through a downcomer. Okay? And so all of these have different ways that they have places so that the flow will go down to the next through these downcomers. Okay? So that's kind of the basis of what distillation equipment will look like. And we'll be talking more about that throughout the semester. Now, we're trying to get to the point that we can design those internal features of the column. So our design calculations, typically what we're going to know, uh, we'll know what pressure we want to operate at because we will have looked at vapor liquid equilibrium data and we will have de determined that I get a good two-phase split if I operate at this pressure. We'll know the feed flow rate. I usually know the temperature. I usually know the composition fairly well. Frequently, I'll know something about the reflux, whether or not I want it to be a saturated liquid or uh, su uh, subcooled liquid, etc. Saturated liquid is most common. Okay, and then we'll have some goals, what I want this thing to do. So. The first category was things that we know are going to happen in our column. I know what's coming into the column. And then we have goals, okay? I know what I want the column to do. So some of the things might be, not all of these, just, you know, one of these, maybe a couple of these, depending on the number of composition or the number of components. So maybe we're talking about what's the mole fraction of the more volatile component in the distillate or in the bottoms. Or what's the reflux ratio? The ratio of what I produce as distillate to what I send back to the column as reflux. Or fractional recovery of the component in the distillate or in the bottoms. So I want to recover 98% of my material in the distillate because that's my product and I don't want to waste it by sending it out the bottoms because that's going to be my recycle stream. Or maybe I know a flow rate I require for the distillate or the bottoms. Possibly I'll know something like a boil-up ratio. It's more common to know reflux ratio, but a boil-up ratio is also possible. 
And then as I do this, try to meet these goals, what I'm really going to be looking for in those calculations is I want to know how many stages I need, where do I want to do the feed, do I want to do it in the middle, somewhere slightly above or below the middle, maybe at the very top or the very bottom. And I'm going to want to know the energy needs because that's going to relate to cost. This is a, the operating cost, this is going to be very important too. And then the column di diameter. So how wide do I need this thing to be? And that's going to relate primarily to our vapor flow rates. There's going to be some practical guidelines. So before we really do any other calculations, just some kind of general rules of thumb that you should know. And first is that the pressures usually you want them to be between 1 and 7 bar, okay, or 1 and 7 atmosphere if you'd rather. And the reason for that is that I can build a column that's structurally sound at reasonable expense if it's in these pressures. If I go below one bar, I'm operating under vacuum and I have to build a little bit of a stronger column to operate under a vacuum, otherwise they'll suck in. Okay. If I have something over seven bars, it's very difficult for it to, because of the size of these, to withstand those pressures. Um, you're also dealing with gases at high pressures, so if the tank were or the tower were not to be secure and strong enough, you would have this gas explosion happening. So we want to be careful about choosing pressures that we know our tower can be structurally sound. We're also going to be kind of concerned about what temperatures I operate at. Okay, I mean I could choose any temperature, but the condenser, the cheapest way to cool the material is to use a heat exchanger with cooling water as the coolant. Okay? Cooling water is typically going to be cooled in cooling towers and usually we get it down to maybe 30 degrees. And if that's the case, then I really can only reach a condenser temperature of maybe 40 degrees. So I'm going to look at condenser temperatures typically Goal is 30 to 50 degrees. Okay. Now the reboiler pressure, I'm going to set that so that I can use whatever hot utility streams I have available. These can vary. It doesn't have to be saturated steam at one atmosphere. Usually what happens in most plants is you'll have some higher pressure steam that is going to be at a higher temperature to go along with that pressure. So you'll need to know what those utilities are available for your plant. And then the pressure is going to change across the column. And typically we design so that it will be about a 0.1 psi pressure drop per stage as I go through the column. That's just a kind of typical value. Now, <clears throat> we're going to have condensers at the top and the bottom. We can go from having all of it be liquid to all of it be vapor to part of it be liquid and part of it be vapor. Okay. Normally, we assume a total condenser, which means all of the stuff coming out the top of the tower, all the product we take is a liquid. Okay, So if I do that, I don't have this stream D2 that I've shown here. So it comes up, it gets condensed, all of the material that comes out is a liquid, so the composition here would be exactly the same as the composition here, and so the distillate here has the same composition as this, L0 has the same composition as this, this is not an equilibrium stage. Okay, I'm not waiting for it to get to equilibrium, I'm condensing it until it all condenses. But if I use a mixed condenser or a partial condenser, I'm going to have some or all of it become vapor. And if that's the case, I'm returning liquid to the tower and taking some vapor off here whether I have liquid coming here or not, I still have vapor up here and liquid down here, which means this is an equilibrium stage. Okay, So most times we're going to use a total condenser. Sometimes I'll use a partial condenser. We'll have a similar game we'll play with the reboiler, but just so that you'll start getting accustomed to the vocabulary so that when we solve problems. Speaking of solving problems, let's talk once again about those 
um, equations that we're going to be needing to solve. So the balances that we're going to do. If I look at a total column, that column I just was showing earlier today, okay, I have a feed stream coming in, boiler and distillate product coming out. So my overall material balance is very simply F equals B plus D. My components, well, just this is a lot like a flash. If I just ignore everything that's happening inside, the composition of the material coming in we designate Z. The composition of the two products, the boiler and the dis the boiler, the bottoms and the distillate product, are going to be a liquid form typically, and so X, designating liquid composition, of either the bottoms or the distillate, and so this is my component material balance. I could do it for any of the products, but if I'm looking at a binary system first, then I would do this typically for the more volatile component. And then I've got an energy balance, and an energy balance is just these streams times their enthalpies in and out, and then adding in the heat transfer associated with the condenser and the reboiler. Recognizing that the condenser, I'm actually removing heat from the system, and the reboiler, I'm adding heat to the system. So this would be a negative Q, this will be a positive Q, but if I want to deal with the signs, okay, then I'm going to just have them both added here as QN as my positive designation. So this concludes our material on Chapter 3. Um, in our next lessons, we will be looking at Chapter 4 and beginning to actually analyze what happens inside our columns.